Dear Postumans, dearest tribe, family, friends, colleagues, people I know and people I don't know, thanks for being here today, celebrating the beauty of existence, sharing about existential posthumanism. I am so delighted to know that you are together in beautiful Rome, connecting energies, visions, and insights. Today is a very special day. We are together to reflect on existence. And existence is free, is creative, is generative, is generous, is surprising. And the reason why I am here with my voice, but not with my physical presence, is that existence had some different plans for me. I was so much looking forward to seeing you all. And yet, I had a medical emergency and I could not fly. I'm here upstate New York, enjoying this deep time of healing, of silence. And the day when I had this medical emergency, something very special happened. And I'm going to share this with you today as a little secret, as a gift, as a moment of deep sharing. I did uh, not expect what was going to happen, but when I was at the hospital, I was in a life critical condition. And yet, instead of being something terrible or, uh, or uh, full of despair, it was a moment of incredible connection. I felt this overwhelming energy, love, if you want to call it love, that was really all-encompassing. And all the voices would come. I could hear voices from the people there, the nurses or the doctors. And they were specific voices of specific people. And yet, they were all connected in this amazing energy that was so uplifting. I felt so good. I felt so, so much love. Love is probably the, the easiest and best way to describe this amazing sensation that I had for many days after this medical emergency occurred. And I would like to share this because I know that some of you at the moment are distressed about what is happening in the war, in, uh, in the Middle East, in, uh, inside of us. And I want to say that this deep, unconditional love is really at the base of existence. And it is important for us to connect understand that we are never alone, that we can play the game of this connection, we can play the game of death, the game of war, but at the end it is really one, one energy and many, as we could say in uh, existential posthumanist terms, it is really a monistic pluralism or a pluralistic monism. And yet the term that I would like to bring back is this unconditional love, this energy that is sustaining us all, and it is us all. And so, with this personal story that I would like to share today with you, I am so excited to 
listen to all the amazing insights that are going to come today to this beautiful discussion shared by our amazing Debashish based on the question, what is a posthuman life? And also, what is a posthuman death? How can we live as posthumans? I am also very honored to know that a lot of you have read my book, The Art of Being Posthuman, that came out as an act of love. I really wanted to share my insights and I feel all the love that you are sharing with me through your comments and your presence and your generosity in life. Thank you so much for existing. Thank you so much for being part of this community and a place P in parentheses is art, P, art, part, art of this community. I love you all so much. I am right now sleeping because I am in the US and it is three o'clock in the morning. So you are in my dreams, I'm sure. And uh, thank you so much for everything. We are always connected. Always connected. Always connected. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful discussion. So much love to you all. Just a moment of silence to uh, gather our energies uh, for her well-being. Okay, so post-humanism means many things to many different people. I don't think there's a single definition for post-humanism, but this is a panel for existential post-humanism. And I'll say a few words related to her message, and then we can open up a discussion around some of the themes of her book. As Francesca said in her uh, address, uh, she had a special experience. She didn't just have a medical emergency, she had a special experience during the emergency. And it was the experience of connectedness. And this is a very special thing from the viewpoint of existential post-humanism. Because on the one hand, when we're talking existential post-humanism, we mean how can we as existing beings have a post-human life? Post-humanism can be seen in, in a broader context. But the point that Francesca is making is that existential post-humanism looks at post-humanism as a inside-out phenomenon. It starts right here. It starts with us here and now. And we can talk about post-humanism as a set of ethical precepts. We need to do this, we can do this, we have to do this, etc. But ethical precepts only have so much mileage because we are trying to use the mind to control our own impulses in various ways. But experience is another thing. Experience goes much deeper than our ethical precepts. And when we are talking about an experience of connectedness, it's not a matter of belief, faith, etc. It's a matter of experience. And if there is an experience of connectedness, Along with it comes a kind of uh, ethics, the ethics that follows experience. Our normal experience gives us the possibilities of some ethics. But another kind of experience gives us other possibilities of ethics. And so in her address, she used 
this experience as a kind of launching pad to talk about existential posthumanism. And one of the terms she used there, again, for those who were not present, is monistic pluralism. She said uh, she used the term in both its uh, formations, monistic pluralism or pluralistic monism. This is what she said. And it's, a, I think, a kind of a term for contemplation. It's really a term that we can think about, uh, contemplate as forming a kernel for existential posthumanism, because it's really a, a ontological kernel for existential posthumanism as Francesca sees it. And the other thing that she's talking about there is this notion of how we can be posthuman as an art. She ends with that. She talks about being a part of the posthuman world, and the word part is split into P and art, an art of being a part, which again relates to this sense of connectedness. Connectedness is not a given. We are not given that connectedness. And when we are talking about the experience of connectedness, the art of being posthumanism is, is an aspect of that experience of posthumanism. So I think I'll stop there and I'll turn it over to Joanna. And we might toss it back and forth a few times and then open it up for a larger discussion. I need to use that or just speak? You can just speak. Yeah, okay. this, this, um, I don't think this is working anymore. A little bit. Um, tēnā koe, ko tōles te monga, ko waimakareri te awa, ko pasko te pāno, ko tiriti o waitangi te tangata, nō o te tahi a hau, ko Joanna te poingoa. Um, I just said hello to you because I haven't met you. Some of you I know well now, but not everyone. I come from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and I gave you uh, a positioning of myself and the whenua, the land that I stand on when I'm in Aotearoa, New Zealand, just to introduce myself. Um, <clears throat> I, I've been reading Francesca's book, so I'm very happy to be with you this morning. and. Um, I, I wanted just to think about those two questions that Francesca was mentioning. What is a post-human life and what is a post-human death? And in Francesca's book, she talks about, I'm quoting her, she says, life is a journey and we are the wanderers. Anything can happen and eventually does. And I think um, what Francesca is going through right now is an example of anything happening, and sometimes surprising things happening. Um, <clears throat> Francesca writes, and she talks a lot in her book about change, that change is expected, change is inevitable. But she also writes that on the post-human path, the what is the how. What we are manifesting, and the ways in which we are manifesting are not different. And it made me think, actually, her book is this as well. The what is the how. She brings subject and object together into this existential framework. Because throughout the book, and you can see on the front of it, there is a spiraling picture. It is the architecture of a labyrinth. The what is the how in this very book because the way you read the book and she constantly invites us to read the book as if it is a labyrinth so you can go into the book where you want to go in and exit where you need to exit and I think that when I read I took that invitation up to whirl through the book 
So I dipped into hashtags and different parts of the book as if the what was the how. And I think um, the second part of the title, uh, it's the art of being post-human, but then Francesca poses a question, who are we in the 21st century? And we know the answer to that question. So she really asks us to consider it. But I did land on something I'd like to read. We are everything. This is, these are Francesca's words. We are everything. Relations. People. Intentions. Thoughts and words. Behaviors. Beliefs. Narratives. Archetypes. Genetics and epigenetics, lifestyles, diets, products, dreams, actions and reactions, emails and websites, posts, pictures, digital traces, bodies, organs, past and future generations, microorganisms, the biotechnospheres, the planet, the sun, the galaxies, the universes, and so on. We are the potential and the unlimited, being and non-being. So um, I think it's very expansive, but at the same time we can make it very local. And as you said before, it starts within us. And um, Francesca's going through a moment right now that really heightens this awareness. And when I was reading the book, I went through my own experience of losing my dad. And I think I want to link that to the second question of what's a post-human death. Because Francesca puts stories into her book. She talks about her nonna. She talks about her relationship with a plant that grows on her balcony, a mandarin, a kumquat plant that she eats. And through these stories, you start to think about your story. She invites you to do that, for our stories to join. So when I was reading the book, I went through my own existential awareness. When you are near to death, it seems that everything else changes and you can only be aware of really what matters and a lot of things fall away. And my father, interestingly, was an architect who appreciated structure, simple materials, the interplay of light and form, and also a joining of the what and the how, the subject, the object, coming together. Yesterday I attended a session on architecture as being the future of philosophy, which I found very interesting. But he always designed in communication with his clients, listening to the needs of families and the homes he co-created with them. So I just want to note that when my father passed away, it was night and there was a full moon in the sky and I felt very connected to that moon. It somehow seemed like a beautiful symbol of what was occurring, this transformation into another space for my father, who lived a full life, so I can be happy that he lived a full life. But there was this connection to my family, to nature, to the full moon. It was also the winter solstice in New Zealand, so just in June. And there was that sense of transformation, this um, bigger sense that we are living. What are we doing when we're here? We're connecting with each other. So I'll leave it there for now, but um, it was interesting that this was happening to me while I was reading the book, and there was a good connection between the book and myself. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Joanna. And uh, I think as you mentioned, this notion of bringing together the what and the how, yeah. it's, it's so important and so central to uh, even the way in which she talks about her own experience, the sense of connectedness, the architecture that you pointed out, and 
even the way she parses the notion of being a part of the post-humanism with part and art together. Mm. In other words, we as part of the, you asked that question which, which you read out, and I think as you were reading it out, Joanna, the, the, the question about who are we in the 21st century, I think that's a contemplation. And again, that's another aspect that Francesca puts a lot of em emphasis on with regard to pedagogy. Mm -hmm. Learning is not just information. We're not just receiving words and turning them into some kind of mental understanding that we put into classificatory cubbyholes mm -hmm. and then build these maps of comparison with. But learning is essentially allowing ideas to percolate and settle somewhere where something invisible and unknown is going to turn them into something else. And so who are we in the 21st century and the entire, you know, kind of long list of things that we are becomes an invitation to a contemplation, becomes an invitation to varieties of identification and relation, relationality that allows this percolation of the world into ourselves. Who are we in the 21st? We are the world. We are each other. We are parts of the whole. And that's where the what and the how come together, because what, as parts of the whole we are, is also how we can experience being parts of the whole. That's the art of being, being the part, the art. In other words, there's a praxis involved. It's not just a matter of, I read these words, I think about it, it's a good idea, and I go away from it, and maybe sometimes I think about it. But it's living that contemplation and making that into a praxis of relationality, where one actually extends identification to the other and sees that there is, in fact, no binary. That's one of her, the three main pillars of existential posthumanism for Francesca yes. is, uh, you know, post-binary, post-anthropocentric, and post-human. So post-binary in that sense that we build, again, this world of entities, and these entities are distinct. Uh, each one has its own sense of myself and the other. Ultimately, the binary is that. The binary, we can think of good and evil or other kinds of opposites, but they all come down to myself and the other. You are my binary, you see. But that is what she's challenging. She's saying that we are each other. We are parts of each other. And even if we, we take one more step, that's what she's talking about in her statement. We are each other. There is a whole of which we are a part and which we are. And then there comes this notion of how can we be the art of experiencing that? That becomes the, the tenet of existential post-humanism uh, in terms of a idea and a praxis, mm -hmm. uh, a, 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 a subject and an object, or a what and a how in, in this case. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I really resonated to what you said, Joanna, about the, the, the specifics of that in each of our lives, uh, what it means for Francesca with the plants that she's dealing with, uh, what it means for you with your relationship with your father, mm. and the expansive idea of that, how that relates to the elements, yes. the cosmos, and you know we become uh, the other through relationship. And Again, yes. And, and she yes. really asks us to consider deeply who we are and then what we want to do, and it's a call really, if I can just read some Please. more of the words. Go, go ahead, yes. uh, this is on the, there are eight meditations in the book and you can read them in any order. 
Uh, you can read it from beginning to end as well if that's what you want to do, or you can just pop in and read one of them at a time. But in the first one, Francesca says, because we matter, because if we do not bring our voices out, if we do not enact our visions and intentions, no one will be able to do it for us. Not to be relics of time and the wheel of evolution. We have to be brave. See what we see. Change what has to change. Everything is always changing anyway. Nothing will ever be the same. Here we are, now, living the dreams of the people who came before us. Think about it. We inherit our genes from our ancestors. We live, work, and move through cities, buildings, roads, which in most cases were built years before we were born. Visions of other times. And I think that's very apparent when we're walking through the streets of Rome. Right. We can feel the layers of history here. But that call to action to be brave to see what we can see and do what we can do. Because if we don't do it, who will? So it's a, a big call to action from Francesca. Right. Yeah. So maybe with that, we can open it to the group. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think this, this uh, panel today is the last day of this conference. And some of us, I think, including Joanna, are going to go to a summer camp. We are. Right? And that's an aspect of this whole thing, which is that it needs time. You know, sitting here, talking to each other over two hours, we cannot become parts of, of each other because deep relationality cannot take place. But we can still connect and we can take back something you know, Joanna can talk about her personal experience or one or two people can talk about something of, of their personal experience. We don't enter the layers of each other <laughs> in a two-hour period. But that's where the notion of spending time together, that's also the whole idea of time, as she read, about existing in various dimensions of time at the same time. And you know, the beaut beautiful thing you mentioned Rome mm. is how the physical layers of time still exist here. It, it hasn't partly due to tourism, but partly also due to the way in which the city has grown. There are walls that nobody's, no tourist is going to go to, but it's in your face that go back to you know, many hundreds of years. And so it's walking through this archaeology of, 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 of the city. Uh, and I think we are like that, each of us is like that. Some of it is known, some, a lot of it is unknown. And our encounters are like that as well. We are encountering difference, but we are also encountering layers of ourselves. And that is an aspect of the relationality that we have to build from ground up, starting here and now, as the whole notion of existential post humanism is. I have no idea if I'll see any of you in the rest of my life. And some of you may become intimate you know, people in my life, and neither you nor I know about that. That might happen. At the same time, each encounter is an encounter of that whole. And if we start with the assumption that this is a, just a moment which will get dissolved in time, then we have a certain kind of experience of each other. And if, on the other hand, we have the experience of the richness of depth in even this moment, which may never repeat again, it's a totally different kind of experience. Mm -hmm. So I think with that, I, I would like to open it up to others, reflections, 
questions, comments. This again is not a session for, you know, kind of question answer in the sort of sense of... The what is the how. Exactly. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah. um, it's more uh, uh, a topical theoretical question of personal experience, but uh, um, if, if we speak of existential post humanism, mm -hmm. we automatically evolve the whole tradition of existential yes. philosophy and yeah. French existentialism. True. And uh, if you think of the philosophy of Sartre, for example, this was a philosophy which is very much concentrated on the yes. isolated subject, while the others are a threat of your liberty mm -hmm. and so sometimes for incongruence or the, the, the view of the other fixes you and uh, imitates your liberty. And so, um, in the first, on the first view, I think that doesn't fit so much with the mm -hmm. relational yeah. ontology of posthumanism. Yeah, it's quite you. the opposite, isn't it? And so I'm a bit surprised that there is this turn to existentialism. So, I mean, in a theoretical, yeah. theoretical way, how does this really fit together? The yeah. isolation of the Look, subject and religion? Thank you so much for that question because I also went through this thinking and I, when I was writing my thesis, I was writing about post-human and I started talking about existentialism and I got that critique from my supervisors immediately. And thank goodness Francesca immediately has gone through it and talks about this. Um, she talks that, um, she, she provides some clarity about this to avoid this confusion because the European existentialism, Saad, that you're talking about, um, is they, they have a relationship, but they are distinct. So the European existentialism is, still holds the human as the main subject. And in existential post-humanism, we explore the values of human existence, our existence, asking who are we in the 21st century, but the human is not the main subject. We move into a post-dualism. -dualis we have this uh, natural cultural convergence, the coming together, the part, the part of, we are the part of the whole. So we can um, think about our resonances and impacts and affects and ethics of being in the world, not just about the human's existence. We move into the non-human continuum. Absolutely, yes. So, so again, just as you know, she uses this term, I think you, she, I, I kind of uh, played a recording since she couldn't be here, uh, where she uses the term monistic pluralism. Mm -hmm. And it is a critique of the kind of existentialism that Sartre represents. Mm -hmm. Sartre's rep uh, existentialism is not the normative existentialism. We can make it so for ourselves or we can buy into it, but that doesn't make it normative. So the question is, there are, just like post-humanism is a plural concept, existentialism is also a plural concept. There are many who feel that there is a monistic basis to existentialism. There could be such a basis. Heidegger himself holds that kind of an existentialism. Sartre derives from Heidegger by shutting out the individual from what he would call the realm of being. But can I add a little thing? Yes. Uh, Sartre also uh, takes his personal experiences at the base, which he describes mm. in literature. Yes. And um, if he, for example, in La Nausée, I don't know the English translation of this guy, so I don't know, uh, he describes the experience of a tree, and he, he doesn't experience this as a um, it's kind of a sacred wholeness, but he's disgusted by the pure contingency of beings. But it is also a personal experience, but which doesn't lead to this feeling of relatedness, but quite a kind of isolation. But he describes this as a personal experience. So is this a, uh, is he wrong, or is this experience not authentic? Because um, existentialism also is not really a derived theory, but also a lived experience. Yes, mm. well, I would say I'd, I'd, I'd defer to Joanna, but I'll just say what, what I feel about that is that no given experience is final. Mm. That if we take a certain given experience and build a universal theory about it, that itself is a problem. And there are a variety of experiences of the same that can be had, which is why the what is the how in this case. How, what is the art of being post-human already opens up this 
notion of epistemology. Epistemology is not absolute. It is dependent on our praxis. So self-transformation gives you a completely different ontology from what you receive because we are layered and we are made into subjects by various factors that we can't take for granted as absolute. Joanne. Well, I feel, I feel like, you know, I, I can't speak for Sarge's experience, but this it offers us a frame to go beyond, um, yes, we have our own experience, but we can also connect with a wider one. So, you know, I can't speak for, for Sarge, who knows. <laughs> but the, that lived experience is very much part of this as well that we are part of everything. And in fact, um, if you read the book, you can see Francesca's lived experience runs through it. We, we learn stories from her life as well. But I guess she positions it in a way to say, there is one example when she's in the store and someone, someone's having a difficult experience in the store and she's having a positive one, right. where we all can position ourselves that's differently. True. That's true. We can be um, the prisoner in the cell who's having a terrible time, the life sentence. We can be the monk in the, in the cell who's actually enlightened, and they're living in a similar sized space. So our position, our framework of how we think things through and feel things through and enact things through can be very different. Mm -hmm depending on how we position ourselves within it. Yeah. But thank you for your questions. Yeah. Is there anyone else who would I, like I to think, offer? Uh, yeah. uh, yeah, we have several. Would you tell us your name? As, yeah, please. I'm uh, Mark Sertz from Germany. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Shall we go here and then here and then here? OK. Yeah, yes. round. Thank yes. you. I'm Sam from Now, so thank you for the presentation. I, I wanted to learn something about post-humanism. Mm. But I must say I haven't really grasped it. Grasped it. Because either this is a general thesis about interconnectedness of everything, mm -hmm. which is you know, not in the world. In a way it's empty, it's everything unless, <clears throat> unless it is considered a hint uh, or a idea to experience some this that and then of course it becomes significant uh, and more like a mystical sort of attitude which is also not uh, from the quotes that I heard <coughs> I I was somehow felt, I felt uncomfortable because all the all the, all the examples you gave are about connections of of course, there are very important relationships are perhaps the most important But these are the relationships with people, perhaps with some animals, perhaps with the earth, if you want or not want. The same. But then we, I, I heard you know, that there's the same sort of relations to the galaxy somewhere. This seems to me not only unconvincing. It seems to me to kill the whole idea. If my connection to you and to a galaxy somewhere, billions of years, of light years from here, is the same sort of thing, that means nothing, completely nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah, but experiencing a connection, this of course is something very different. Huh? And but if we talk about human experience, there are also experiences of isolation. It's also an experience. Mm -hmm. In this sense, the Sartre and so on. It's based on experience rather than more ideas. So, so there are all sorts of experiences. I think it's important to, to feel the, connect, the connections, but, but why is it a position that can be called new or something, you know, special, post-humanist? I cannot really hear it. Okay. Joanna, would you like to? Oh, you're okay. fine. You All right, I'll start. Feel that. Yeah, I'll start. <laughs> uh, in some ways, I think a uh, number of things that you said uh, apply in the, in the sense that 
it's nothing, there's nothing new in what is being said, except that it's being framed in a new way for our time. Uh, when we're using the term post-humanism, we are actually using a certain definition of what we've identified with ourselves. We are human beings because there's a historical idea of the human that we've bought into. And that idea of the human makes us experience the world in a certain way. And the idea of praxis over here is that that idea of the human has, has brought us to this world that we are experiencing, that we consider to be a norm, normative experience. We say we experience like this, we experience like that, etc. They are genuine experiences, but they're framed. They're framed by who we've become. So from that point of view, if you call it a mystical experience, it's not a mystical, mystical experience that just comes out of the blue. It's really the praxis towards a different norm of being human. So it's more like, it, it not, not like an isolated thing that I just buy into this and create a, some kind of a new age mystical experience that I'm holding to be uh, something new. But it's a philosophical attitude towards the re revision of the human in that sense, that you know, the, the, the experience of connectedness, not just the thinking of connectedness, but the, I, you started with that by talking about if it matters if it's an experience. So the praxis that leads to that kind of an experience as a definition of a new kind of way to live in the mainstream world, not in some monastery. It's fine if you're living in a monastery, or in the forest, but a revision of the world, because the interdependence of the world depends on it. We are interdependent without recognizing it. Right? So can we experience that interdependence in, in the sense that it becomes the way in which we understand and live our lives? Uh, that's the, that, those are the stakes for post-humanism, as I understand. And certainly we can um, look at post-humanism too as a companion to a lot of indigenous cosmologies and deep wisdom from ancient times that is still being held. I come from Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Te Ao Māori, the Māori world, is a um, very interconnected um, positioning of people uh, and terrible violence has been done to indigenous peoples over time, but now we are finally hopefully come in full circle to be companions in thought and doing and being. Which also relates to that issue of who we are today. Who, who are we in the 21st century? Uh, because we, and you started talking about the European tradition, etc. It's what we've become by subtracting or dominating or suppressing many other ways of being which exist, and we assume that either they don't exist, they don't matter, or they're actually not of any help to us, or they're mystical in some kind of a, a sort of an esoteric way that is only available to those who want to lead some kind of fringe life. Uh, but if we revise the human to understand the historical injustice, of colonialism across the world, we start thinking about the human in a different way mm -hmm. that empowers these notions of uh, another experience of the world, of the whole. Thank you. Tasha, you have something to say? No, my name is Tasha. I'm a poet. I'm an artist. I'm a photographer. And I'm exactly exploring um, the field, the entering uh, philosophy art, which in this moment, in this very moment, in this very, I take the experience of art process, artistic process, as, a, as an experience of myself. And I would like to sort of um, comment a little bit uh, from my research, and then I'll end up with a question that is also something that I am tickling. So um, uh, you said that um, it's nothing new, but framed in a new way. 
and to weave this new way in the non-anthropic century way. And this is a very difficult thing in philosophy, actually, because I'm, I'm doing exactly the, my title is a species in the non-anthropic century which means I thought it's quite easy. It's totally uh, like diving into a notion because uh, you have uh, the, the language, at least, for, for, for the beginning. So what I found is that I found in the school good years, idea of fundamental practice, which means that uh, any practice will show you how theory is limited. And then the second thing that I did was uh, like from Sarah's experience, which is very human centered. I uh, I read Invisible and then Invisible of Malone uh, which he, he the first two, two of these chapters are on Sarah, on how he tackles all the time, you know, with Sarah. And then in the end he ends up with this idea of the, um, the, Polish, uh, the, the flesh of the world. And this is, uh, well, if we are philosophers and we want to stay in philosophy, this is that moment of the center opening, a very significant one. And then I, I, I sort of feel how it's, but it is too easy to say that the non anthropocentric perspective, we, we jump too easily to mystical. We end up in this part of planet and you know, interconnectedness, but we, if we stay in, in, if we don't jump so much into mystical, then we, uh, we have to include non European. But not exactly mystical, right? Because non anthropocentric first of all, has to somehow include uh, being non European, at least, centered. And then um, what I found difficult, uh, because I am using the epistemontology, which is what and how together of Karen Barad, who is a realist. And she claims she is a realist. But actually, she is defining phenomenon, phenomenon as if not really being a realist. And uh, I have this um, uh, this problem. This will be the question: how how to tackle the uh, the um, the accusation of the realist that uh, phenomenology which would be about experience and a species that I um, you know, explore, um, that phenomenology shouldn't, for some realists, I would say phenomenology shouldn't touch ontology, that it's epistemology, that it started from the reduction, the phenomenological reduction, that it, it reduced, yeah, and you, 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 you like Husserl did, Maria Blumanti, of course, opened it, but in the very core, phenomenology is like it's um, cons experience centered, but not in vain, in some, some the, the, the real world is reduced. And why I ask this question? Because in my exploration, the real, becomes non-human in a radical way, like not accessible. And then if we don't jump into mysticism, but we still want to stay in philosophy and talk about the access to the non-human, then um, what kind of experience actually is? And how to answer uh, you know, this, this clash of realism and phenomenology. Uh, uh, having in mind that perhaps Malopontin is no longer a phenomenologist because he, he actually does quote ontological right. statements. So, right. so this is the, the end of my, not like slow, but the end is so important in my research that I cannot actually yeah. easily quote myself. Yeah.
Thank you. I, I think it's, it's a really, uh, I mean, deep question, profound question. Uh, w w when you invoke people like Karen Barad and also Merleau-Ponty idea of the flesh of the world, I think you are entering into the domain of what, what is called the new materialism, which really is a redefinition of the real. You know, when we are saying what is the real, or even what is the material. Of course, the real is not necessarily only the material. Uh, it, you know, but still, uh, as far as we are considering material, the new materialism is essentially saying that our definition of matter in terms of the properties that are, you know, being given to us by our descriptions are not necessarily the properties. Again, it's part of the monistic pluralism. I will agree with you and also with you about the kind of vapid nature of jumping too quickly into identification with cosmos, spirit, and things like that without grounding it in a different idea of materialism or in the flesh of the world, as you call it. I think that's more important. In a way, that is part of the, you mentioned non-anthropocentric. I think, as Francesca says, one of them is non-binary. Uh, this whole spirit matter divide has become a binary. When we use the word mysticism, we're already assuming this binary. Uh, so in a way, what we are called to do is to understand the real in a new way. The real is not the real that is a common assumption of what is the real. In other words, the real is creatively reconstructed in our praxis itself. Right. Now, the difficulty with that is that we are embedded in a common conception of the world. That we may think of the world in whatever way we want, but the world doesn't think of itself or of us according to how we think of it. That's true to some extent. To some extent, we are participatory beings. The world is not something that's fixed. Our praxis is also transforming not only ourselves, but our environments. But still, environments are also limited. And there are you know, limits to where you can push, right? So that's where, I think that's where the difficulty lies. It cannot be a isolated praxis. It cannot be something that people hold. We go back to the mystical over there. It's not, it, it cannot be something that a few individuals buy into and practice for themselves as if changing their ideas and their personal experience can change the world. The idea is it can eventually if people see the need for it. And there is maybe, you know, some philosophers are talking about the necessity of a we. I mean, you cannot change the world all at once but you can change it in small collectives, in islands that form alternative ontologies. So that, that exerts its pressure. And things happen in a different way. And these differences can never be the same. Uh, for example, in post-humanism itself, uh, Francesca, uh, all of us are part of something called the Global Post-Human Network. And that has chapters across the world. I'm, I also am uh, one of the directors of the Indian Posthuman Network, to which posthumanism means something very different from what it means maybe to Joanna or maybe to the global posthuman network. We are working it out through our praxis and our understanding of, of the emic situation in that particular culture. So it is only through praxis that we can define it for our collective lives. Re what, what is the real? Or what is the meeting of the phenomenological and the ontological? And luckily, Kasia is coming with us, so she will be yeah, with us for the five well, days. Well, OK. It's funny, but it's just an impression, impression, perhaps not even a question, that the moment you try to explain the real, this thing that we need through practice, you started, uh, you, you started using the word change, mm -hmm. as if we were here 
to know the real and change it, <laughs> you know, or, or even at least the praxis with the real. But I, I am wondering about that the wider sort of more of existential um, yeah. experience uh, of why change from what to what, uh, you know, and the, the question of creativity and yeah. the, the possibility of the new. Yeah. Francesca says we are being yeah. what we are becoming. Yeah. That change yeah, is coming. always there. We are yeah. being what we are becoming. Yeah. Thank you. Monica. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Monica. I think, I think it's certainly a mistake to think about, I mean, from the post-human point of view, to think about uh, relationality as a kind of a, you know, identification or union uh, which erases the notion of inequality. The inequality in the world is rampant and that is the basic reason for developing post-human theory. Post-humanism is grounded on inequality and on po micropolitics. So there is, of course, macropolitics, which is how national governments operate and kind of, you know, act out these inequalities. But there's micropolitics, which is happening inside us and in our relations all the time. Now, the difference between when we are talking about things like union, etc., the difference between a kind of a humanist politics and a post-humanist politics 
would be that the humanist politics already assumes an us and a them. It's like we are at war from the get-go. But in a post-humanist, I, I said we, we are at war from the very beginning. We are already into camps. We are already into parties. You know, it's, it, the word party is related to that part and art, you know. A party is already a part, right? We are, we are these distinct people who are against each other. But the post-human view to it is, yes, there are inequalities in the world, but underneath those inequalities, there is something which is the same. And if there isn't a dialogue between these two, then it's only a kind of a perpetuation of the cycle of revenge that will go on and on, or the cycle of trying to build a world together that will just suppress the resentments. Mm -hmm. Unless there is something ontological that can override that, that works with it, the political has to include that which is underneath it, not the, I'm, I, I mean, I think the whole tenet of post-humanism is created due to the political. Yes, and we did hear Francesca say at the start um, how she's thinking about the wars that are happening right now. Um, and also um, underlying a lot of her thinking is this notion of care, that we have to care for each other. It's a big change, isn't it, to think yeah. that we are connected to some of the uncomfortable things that are happening in the world, that we are part of this problem. But um, we have to be yeah. aware of it, yeah. acknowledge it, not discount yeah. it, yeah. to help transform it, right. even if it is a micro-transformation. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, well, your examples are very important, but they are I would say that human, <coughs> humanity, the only other human being. So of course it's very important to overcome those inequalities and, and, and oppression. And but if you talk about post-humanism and you put everything, mm -hmm. then it would mean that there is, you know, there should be no division between us and mosquitoes. I don't know. And of course there should be. I mean, so so why is it post-humanism rather than I don't know? Wild humanism or humanism including all humans, rather, what is the post? I just mean, yeah. post humanism. Well, the post is okay, when you use the term human, we are already kind of either assuming that we all accept a certain understanding of the species, right? That we are all human, we have some characteristics with whether we have culture or not, we all, all have that. And those who are not human don't have that, right? So that kind of an idea is already something that is assuming a certain identity. Well, when we're saying post-human, we're saying that that identity has become much more fossilized than even the way in which you are thinking about it. When you're saying human in some kind, the normal way we use the word human, we actually override that whole idea that there's a certain kind of humanism that has become globalized right now. You know, we, we override that, we assume it, but we act as if it doesn't exist. But uh, actually speaking, what is the human? The human is something that has built these walls between the human, the non-human, different kinds of humans that have different statuses of being human. Some humans don't matter. They're actually not really human, as far as we are concerned. We can get rid of them. That's the whole necropolitical. We can, they can die. They're not part of our human rights. And there are some moves to include the non-human through rights. For example, I'm just because that's where I've come from, I talk about my own position in Aotearoa, New Zealand. We have given rights of nature to a maunga, a mountain, Taranaki, a forest, Urawera, and the river, Whanganui. They have rights. Uh, it, it doesn't go far enough, in my opinion, because these entities have been here for much longer than the humans were living in Aotearoa, New Zealand. But now they have um, protection from us, <laughs> so they can continue to exist safely. 
And also we have given animal sentience legally in New Zealand. Uh, it doesn't mean to say that animals are treated as well as they could be on the ground, but at least legally they have been given the acknowledgement of their own mm -hmm. beings. And so th this comes back to the question of the mosquito, right? <laughs> and actually in, in Francesca's book, she'll take it all the way down to the virus, yes. okay? So the question is, yes, the mosquito is different from the human, but there is something in the mosquito and something in the human that are the same. The mosquito, it's not, we are not making the mosquito human. We are saying there's something in the human and in the mosquito that is the same. So can we experience that? That starts transforming ourselves and the mosquito. It's no longer going to be the same. I mean, does, it's not saying that we just assume that right in the beginning and then act towards the mosquito like it's another human, you know. But we do try to open to that something else which is the same in ourselves and the mosquito. And there are, you know, like Joanna was saying, I mean, entire civilizations that have actually worked based on that assumption as a form of experience, not, not just a form of thought a form of experience. And it makes for a different kind of world. Mm. Can I ask? Yes. You mentioned that when I have a discussion about this human in mind, I just want to repeat that there are a lot of us humans. Yeah. And, and this is very difficult to define. Oh. So there is an impossibility in what, what you are Absolutely. Doing. Yeah. This is basically what you said, but I just felt the need to. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. You had it. Uh, uh, my, my initiation to posthumanism was Francesca Pilandos Cleveland's book, mm. Philosophical Posthumanism, which is really an excellent introduction. I advise it to everyone who, yeah. who wants to uh, know what posthumanisms are. I think they are not really completely different philosophies under the label of posthumanism but they converge yeah. from different directions. And uh, this is why it makes so fascinating for me also. I think it has a very integrated force, uh, which really makes it a philosophy of our time, as Francesca Franco said in her previous book. Yeah. And so you can have, um, and I think I already had the impression in the previous book that there is really a kind of a spiritual dimension in Francesca Franco's philosophy, yeah. which I found very interesting. Yeah. But if you come from a more feminist direction, or post or aesthetic, or animal ethics or mm. plant ethics, you have also another access. It's like a kind of an open house with different doors. Yes. And um, you find that uh, and the convergence of the center is because you with a lot of network directions. Yes. And I think it was really the philosophy that was missing for a long time, that you have really something in which converge the uh, experiences and uh, also urgent problems of our time. You can also go in a more political direction with yes. this. And that's, that's only wrong. Which way, which kind of positive direction one choose? Exactly. In my thank yes, you. Thank you. Yeah, very, <laughs> very true and very well put. Thank you. Absolutely. And that goes back to that labyrinth, uh, the going oh, in yeah. and out where you want. That is the book itself, the way you read the book. Or also more technology. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yes. 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 That, that's what I was mentioning about cultures, but it goes far beyond cultures. Yeah. 
that, that there are different the, the post humanism that you understand is based on where you are when you start praxis towards the post human That's the aspect of yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's the aspect of the part as art. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, non-human 
um, relation. Also with the um, technical relation. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, you, you raised quite a lot of points there, but um, and sorry if I haven't followed properly, but um, what you were talking about before, and you as well, Kasia, about the differences, I mean, technology is another difference that we are part of. There is still that, um, well, I call it the life force, the energy that, that is in everything is there in technology as well. And we are interconnected to technology. Uh, I lost, my phone was stolen yesterday, <laughs> and I feel like I lost a limb. <laughs> you try it. Uh, but, um, it, you know, technology, we're part of it. We are connected. Um, so I, I feel also that it's interesting how you said there's so much of the non human in us as well. We apparently have it all ingest the amount of, of a credit card worth of plastic every year and the food we eat. So we have plastic as well. And um, this interconnection is the base of my post form of post-humanism, the one that Francesca talks about as well, where we are all tiny calipers, tiny par particles that we share with everything, including technology. I'm not sure if I've answered your question though. I'm, I'm, I don't think I've answered your question, though. Well, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 another aspect of it that, uh, you know, as I understand what you're saying, is also to think about reality as it unfolds as a technology. So that uh, processes, as you're saying, these processes that are going on inside us, both in terms of, uh, I mean, when, when Francesca or, you know, I, I've forgotten your name. Uh, the, 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 Kasia? Kasia. Kasia. Uh, is talking about creativity. Creativity itself is, is a technology. Poesis is techne. Techne is coming of processes into appearance. Uh, there are kind of technologies involved in that. So, you know, you're, you talk about Stiegler, for example, and technicity, right? Technicity is of that kind. And in a way, yeah, Simon Don, the notion of the trans individual. So yeah. there is a cosmogenesis going on. In other words, we are interwoven into systems of technology. And that, that becoming more conscious of that process is, is equally a, a, a post-human process. So just like we're talking about, you know, the other as not really the other, that there are, you, you use the term transduction, for example. Transduction itself assumes that kind of basis, that substratum, through which exchanges can take place in otherness. See? So th there are uh, kind of collective processes to which we can become creatively uh, aware uh, that are technological. And you know, that's a notion of technology again, it's not just modern, it's, it's in a sense going back. I mean, if we talk about, I'm sure even in you know, ancient cultures uh, of New Zealand, Maori cultures, there would be ideas of this kind. Uh, magic itself, I mean, Simon Don is also looking at this. Magic is the, is the formation of technology. And you know the, the technological terms like yantra is in Sanskrit means machine. Yantra is the magical diagram as well. So it's really in that sense there is a continuum between what we are calling technology as material processes and the ways in which you know things appear through invisible processes which are creative at the same point. Same point. Thank you. Just to continue that point, I thought when I came here, without knowing the word, that you would also consider the issue of post-humans as, you know, we, 
few months, you know, enriched or expanded with all sorts of technical things that many people now have artificial clips, etc. Mm. You can have our phones, of course, but you can imagine our phones being inserted in the brain. Mm. You can imagine even more horrible things to happen. And the question is whether this would make us post-human in some sense mm. or not. I think that's you know, yeah, that is one, that's why when we started by talking about many definitions of the post-human, many people, there's a whole group of people who think that's what's post-human. And then, of course, within this fluid domain of definitions, uh, there is an entire group called critical post-humanism that uh, distances itself from that. Not distances itself through a rejection, but distances itself from the viewpoint of a critique and a, a kind of a conditioned acceptance, so to say. So yes, today we are living in a world in which I'd say our ontology is technological. You know, we are, we are fully technologized beings. The, the machine has disappeared into us. And in a way, it's almost inevitable that the kind of things you're talking about are increasing, not only are going to happen, they are happening but it's going to keep on increasing. We're going to be able to replicate ourselves. We're going to have chips that completely sort of replace the natural, so to say. And yeah. uh, you know, I'm a critical post-humanist uh, that would separate myself from that. However, then things happen in your families. This is this lived experience that yeah. we're part of. And my niece has type one diabetes. She has a, a scanner on her arm and a pump on her hip that goes to an app on a phone and this makes the whole family relax that we know she's going to survive the night and we are so grateful to that technology that is part of her life. So I think well, these things, as you say, will only exponentially increase. Yeah, at the same time, the attitude of you know, our relationship is also going to expand. In other words, there are people, as Joanna was saying, who would sleep better at night knowing that there's some kind of an implant in, inside somebody they love. But there'll also be people who will veer towards the pre-technological, you know, in a sense that they'll reject that. You know, that, that, that pluralism is also inevitable. It's like the uh, necessary inverse that, you know, is part of post-humanism as well. Very expansive. Yeah. I mean, yesterday we had a panel in which exactly there was this entire discussion about, uh, you know, technology, artificial intelligence, and the human, and the notion of becoming. You know, technology does not become. It, you know, that's the other thing that we often take terms, and that's how we ontologize the technological into our lives. We use words like intelligence, learning, etc. And these words have certain definitions in the machine domain. They're not necessarily the same thing, or they're already preempting other understandings of intelligence and learning. After 10 years, nobody will even think of those other ways of learning or intelligence. We'll see ourselves in the model of a technological intelligence. Would anyone else like to share? Can you Sorry. tell us who you are?
currently uh, invested in is on something external to ourselves, thinking that that is what is going to emancipate us, not recognizing that it is indeed enslaving us, uh, or right, like we should always see in that, in that, uh, in that, uh, in that talk. Um, so my question is, uh, because most of our functions as human beings can be delegated to the machine right now, and the more we progress, collectively in terms of technology, better and uh, more efficient we get at that. And, and this post-human concept that uh, kind of envisions, uh, um, that envisions uh, a kind of technological advancement and kind of the dehumanization of human beings uh, seems to be kind of uh, just maintaining the status quo of things and the concept of self-exceeding doesn't seem to be uh, a primary motive. So in the post-human context, how, because uh, to me personally, I would like to believe that the post-human is all about exceeding what we already are and getting beyond where we are. Whereas technology seems to be doing the exact opposite, and yet it's such an important uh, vision of the post-human. Yeah. So, so one thing here is again, we end up creating a binary we end up creating a binary between the natural and the technological. But on the other hand, this kind of binary has accompanied us from the very beginning. You know, Plato didn't want us to write. Plato was saying, let's not write, because if you write, your memory will be impaired. But we wrote all the same. And you know, we have a very different kind of world today because writing exists. And the memory maybe got impaired, but I don't know, we still have memories, right? So the point is that, what is the relationship with technology? When we use the word slave, and particularly since you brought up Simon Don, this is very central to Simon Don's thinking. If we think of machines as slaves, or the inverse is ourselves as slaves of the machine, you see? These models are models of relationality. If you, don't have, if you don't recognize the fact that we are technological beings from the very beginning, that some kind of technology is being used, it's inside us and outside us. It's what kind of relationship are we forming with it? That's what's important. And you know, otherwise we end up with this kind of binary. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy.
No, but the question is, when we are using the word evolving, uh, the human being involved, why do we want technology to make us evolve? It's an expression. You have hands. We could say, well, let's chop off all hands. We still can evolve, right? Let's create a generation which doesn't have hands, right? They can still evolve. But the point is that, not that, right? We are also expressive beings. And whatever function that we express is a technology. It's the extension of a certain function that is being exteriorized in some form of technology. Yes. to listen, I think. Radical listening. I've heard Francesca talk about that as well. Radical listening to each other. When someone has a very different perspective, you have to really deeply listen to it. Um, and Te ao Māori, and I'm not speaking as tangata whenua, not speaking as a Māori person, just as someone who lives in Aotearoa, New Zealand, who is respectful of Te ao Māori, the Māori world, People go back to the gods, the Atua, that's where we start. So the cosmic is there, and the life force is in everything, including the stones. And if we think about those tiny particles and how they are moving slowly, maybe more slowly in a stone than a, in a fast-moving river, but there's still that connection between the fast-moving water over the stones and the cool air and me standing there next to it. And it's a deep connection, I, I feel it, in, into the whenua, the ground, the earth mother, Papatua Nuku is the earth mother. So these connections become somewhat sounding spiritual or mystical, but actually not. They are the very ontology, the very epistemology, the ethical, the political, everything in one. Kotakitanga. That everything is in one, but we are all different. And that is a way of being from the beginning, and it's different to how we are taught in the West. So we have to listen to each other to find out 
Absolutely, yeah. I, I would say that, uh, you know, idealization, as you mentioned, it, it's, it's like the whole paradigm of Orientalism, which uh, really also has it, has, it has a truth, but it also has a, a kind of assumption that we are discrete, different, and cannot build bridges or break through to somebody else. And when we are talking about somebody else, it's not about other cultures. It's, you know, I was born in India, but I don't know who those people of the Upanishads were. If I think I know, it's an assumption. It's the same kind of Orientalism. My country of people who uh, sort of imbibe a certain notion of uh, the Upanishads uh, are historically conditioned to think about the Upanishads in a certain way. But there is a kind of a deep listening involved. If you want to form a relationship, you're not thereby becoming them, but you are thereby connecting with something that they are and which is in you as well. That's, that's the paradigm. I would also like to say something about what you said, Anshul, about evolution. And it relates to the question that, tell me your name again, your name? Miguel. Miguel? Miguel. 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 Okay. Miguel. Miguel. Was talking about, which is that, again, when we are talking about evolution as my evolution or human evolution, there are other forms of evolution going on. See, there is collective evolution. That's the whole notion of the trans individual. There's something impersonal. The fact of writing, for example, has created a world that has collectively evolved. See, that's another kind of consciousness evolution, evolution of consciousness. Something, a being, exists which would not otherwise have existed. Yes, Sasha. I feel like this idea of time um, is so important as it relates to the subject object in our case in this discussion that um, makes me think of birth and inspiration. And that lends itself to Christianity. Right. I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, that was, Joanna was talking about time and about the fact that you know, there are these layers of time that we are not only walking through, that we, that we embody, that we live. Uh, and at the same time, because of the way in which history chops time up into discrete realities, we really put to sleep certain things of the past. And that's political. Because in a way, what's happening is that the victors win and bury the, the, those who are the victims, right? And so we lose that duration. That duration is gone from us. So th th there is a conscious process by, by, by which we have to re-engage with those moments of history where, which we take normally, normally to be finalized. There's nothing is finalized. That's part of the praxis, the praxis of undoing the so-called final in time, in duration. And it feels like a lot of the discussion around Christianism feels like um, a reference to something that we think of as the past, like right. an indigenous yes. ex expression that once was more dominant, if you want to use those kind of words. Yes. But that it's not really just an essentializing of that. Yeah. It's really a, through the experience, changing with it yes. in the future, but yes. interesting. Yes. And it's cyclical. Mm -hmm. The cyclical looking at time as a cycle rather than a, li a linearity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, outside of that linear mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there I go to the cosmic again because when we look out into space, we see the past.
Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and then also going with that. And we might be very reluctant to do that because then we get into this, you know, uh, I don't know the common in English, the sense that you can sort of drown in the sense. Yeah, when, when it comes to feeling, so, so, so. but every one of us, I think, goes into philosophy because we feel something about something and then we want to suddenly know. More. You know, I think that's where, I mean, there, there, there are entire traditions that lead to that, you know, that she, she invoked uh, uh, Bergson, for example. Well, you know, the, the, the knowing and the feeling have a relationship, and it's not a kind of an easy relationship. And it's a relationship that needs attention, uh, you know, and that's what, say, for one of the people is Bergson, who's really dealing with that, with the need for, you know, intuitive uh, entry into that other domain. Yes. Yeah, there, there, there are. I mean, so several of them were already named, you know, like the, the post-anthropocentric, for example, was named, you know. Uh, the post-binary was named. Uh, but also I feel care, care is very important. Compassion and care. These are strong values. And there's, there are, there's a annual conference on uh, the more than human and care. Sorry? There is an annual conference. Um, I think the micropolitical was named as well, you know, the kind of gradients of difference that exist and that, you know, creates for inequality within pluralism. You know. So these, these are all aspects of a post-human and, and the care is not just the responsibility of one person. Yes, we do things as an individual, but I think we need to work towards this community, yeah, a collectivity. We can't just be stranded by ourselves because the problems are too large now. Yes, exactly. We have to work together. And this is this notion of practice, bringing our theory into practice together to see what we can do. Yes. Because this is our moment right now. Yes. There's an urgency, I think. Um, just speaking to that urgency, do you have any suggestions of like side steps that we could take uh, sort of towards this collective of creativity and practice? Well, I mean, you're here right now. That's a good step. Um, we, some of us are going to a camp um, after this in Galliera, Naturama, um, to think about this more together, to enact um, through a more workshop approach to thinking together, being together, and feeling together. Um, but it can be, I mean, another, this is for myself, another thing I've been talking about as often as possible, it seems, is hope punk, the notion of something we can do. So. Um, we can consider, instead of looking at a glass as being half full of water or half empty of, with water, we can think, there's some water in the glass, what can we do with it? Um, we can say hello to a neighbour who may be having a, a moment that they, you don't realise saying hello to them might change their day. You could grow a tomato plant in your windowsill. Little actions, micro-actions. But um, we can also come together to support each other in this. Uh, I think uh, 
I think th this aspect that Joanna is talking about has to do with deepening our relationality with the world, with not just with those we take to be ours, but those we don't take to be ours, but that are in some way ours, you know, that we are re co constituted by. And that through relationality, we can reach into what they are this deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening deep listening or deep sensing, right? And, and that's where the, the ontological assumptions matter, that the pluralistic monism that uh, Francesca was talking about. That there is, I mean, that's where, I mean, we could say, you know, I mean, let's, let's why is Francesca moving towards the spiritual dimension? Mm -hmm. Or why is Joanna talking about the Maori and the fact that, that they experience this cosmic damage? Because it exists. And, you know, if, if we have something in ourselves that knows that, we've covered it over. We can say that our normal experience doesn't have it. But just to say that is not necessarily to say that it doesn't exist. It's, there's something in us that knows it. And it's through practices of, you know, kind of non-normative relationality that we challenge that knowledge to come out. You can talk to a machine. There is deep relationality with machines that happens at the level of processes you know, that's where individuation is taking place. You are a cog in the machine. But also, the principle also a value is a rational value, extract value. Yes. But in this, in the method of integration, the existence of the material. Sure. The paper. Yeah. Ground, yeah. That resistance, the spatialization of a temporal root, yeah. that means uh, the top, the top, is something that uh, um, influences my model. Sure. In a certain sense, it's a uh, dialectic, a material with the material. Yeah. And in the machine, it's a um, more complex one. Yes. Absolutely. And it is very interesting in uh, the work of uh, um, the paleontologist uh, Ravnar, how, in, in his opinion, um, human brain uh, evolved uh, also uh, through this uh, selection that um, came out uh, from the uh, interrelation of the, the the operation that could how uh, uh, to uh, change the, the media, which yeah. uh, is not inside. Yeah. yeah. 